Hello you guys and welcome to a new video. Today's video is a little bit different. Uh, as some of you may know, I have recently this year started doing an MA in Dress and Textile Histories at the University of Glasgow. First of all, this is not sponsored. <laughs> it could be though, University of Glasgow, hit me up. But I will mention really quick that as I am now a student, my, I'm gonna insert here, my Patreon is what keeps these videos going. Uh, please consider supporting me there if you can. I have a $5 tier, uh, which has access to exclusive videos every month. I have a $10 tier that has access to exclusive wrap-up posts with more pictures, links to fabrics, and also polls about what I'm going to do ne next because I am indecisive. And then I have a $20 tier, which also gets a shout out in these videos. So a little bit of background about me. My background is not in art or dress or anything. I did an English uh, language and literature bachelor degree at uh, King's College London. I really enjoyed it. Uh, literature has always been such a big part of my life. But after graduating, I was a bit lost. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I somehow stumbled into historical costuming and eventually all the research I had to do for these costumes became a really big part of my day. And I wanted to explore more of that. And I stumbled, uh, I stumbled across this degree when I was looking for things online. So a little bit of context. Uh, Obviously, I started in September 2020, which is during pandemic times. So obviously my experience of this course is not what it has been in the past years and is probably not what it's going to be in the future either. So uh, for context, all of my lectures, seminars, everything has been held online through Zoom. I am located in Glasgow. They do recommend that you get to Glasgow if you can, because there is a potential of, well, there hopefully would have been a potential of doing in-thing, in-person in research, in-person sessions. Uh, that hasn't been the case so far because the UK has largely mishandled this pandemic. But yeah, so obviously we have a couple of people who have been doing it remotely, so I think they're quite flexible. And I also had no experience within history of art because that's where with, but that's where this uh, degree technically falls. It's history of art, dress and textile history. So a little bit about the course structure. You have some essential mandatory compulsive, compulsory modules that you have to do, and then you have optional modules. These can be from across different schools in the university, or it could just be extra modules that from the dress and textile history umbrella that you can take. In my first semester, I took three modules. Uh, two of them were mandatory. Uh, it was the research methods and skills, which was across the whole of the history of art postgraduate cohort and it was about doing different kinds of research within history of art and utilizing your sources sort of an introduction introductory model for uh, research within history of art which was really useful for someone who wasn't from a history of art or art or anything related at all the other uh, mandatory module was called what's it called is that no Establishing Dress and Textile Histories? Maybe. I think it was called Establishing Dress and Textile Histories. I'll correct it on here if I got it wrong. Oh my god, that's embarrassing. And that was just an introduction into Dress and Textile Histories as an academic field. It's quite a recent field, but it was a really good, it was a really good module to get to grips about the sort of research themes and topics that you can get across and also a lot of the sort of essential names in the field that you should be reading, aka Lou Taylor. And the other module I took, which was my optional module, was within Dress and Textile Histories, and it was called Victorian Visions. And that was by far my favorite module, because as you know, I am a, I am trash for Victorians, to use the banner expression. But yeah, so that was a really good module. I don't really, I'm not gonna go into those modules in particular, because obviously they're done, but I could do like an overview of the past modules if you're interested. I don't know how well this video is gonna do, I don't know who's interested in this. I don't know about the format, we'll see. Basically, I thought I would show you what is a week in a dress history <laughs> student's life. Um, obviously, this isn't going to be the most thrilling footage in the world because I can't leave the house. However, I hope to share a little bit about what I'm learning this week. And so far, it's already been really good. So today is Monday and I was going to do a little this little intro before my lecture, but I forgot I was filming. <laughs> so this semester I am taking three modules and a work placement. That's not usually how it works. I'll explain a little bit more. 
So I have a mandatory module, which is called Applying Dress and Textile Histories, which is kind of a follow up to the previous semesters. And it's more sort of practical decisions or the practical applications of the things you learned in the previous module. Uh, that happens on a Tuesday. I have a two hour session, which is a lecture and a seminar in the morning. Uh, and today I had what we call BOMF, which is the birth of modern fashion. Uh, this is about the long 18th century, so it kind of goes, it gives you a bit of background in the 16th um, and 17th century and then goes into the long 18th century to talk to you about like economical changes, fashionable changes, the creation of fashion. It's been super interesting so far and it's sort of my 18th century module. The other module I'm taking was, is an optional module because basically when you sign up you have the option to do a work placement or to do a, a third module. But they tell you to sign up for a third module in case you don't get a work placement for like um, administrative purposes, I guess, so that you're enrolled from the beginning. I enrolled in preventative, cons preventive, preventive conservation, <laughs> which is a module held by the uh, Textile Conservation Center, uh, which is a different uh, like MA program. But I really wanted to explore a little bit about actual textile conservation because I just thought it was really interesting and I thought this would be a really good introductory module. And then I also applied for a work placement. So the work placements are usually in person, uh, but of course because of the pandemic, mine is remote and it is a digital project with the Victoria and Albert Museum and that is really exciting. I'm not sure how much I can go into that, so I'm just going to put that aside for now. But I did want to keep my conservation module because it's the only one that I'm doing that is to do with textile conservation. So I emailed the module convener and asked if I could do what they're calling an audit, which means that you sit in for lectures and seminars, you do all the prep work, you engage in the discussions and the readings and, you know, you participate, but you don't do assessments and you don't get the credit for the module. It won't show up on your transcript. You won't get the, so the way you pass the degree is by getting a certain amount of credits doesn't count for that. I'm okay with that. <laughs> I realise that it's extra work that I've taken on, which is a little chaotic, but I'm really interested in this learning and I think in the end it sort of evens out. So that is the structure for my semester. Uh, the work placement has its own sort of world, so I do have to do some sort of uh, outputs and assessments for the university, but I also have outputs that I need to do for the institution holding that work placement position, which in this case is the VNA. Yeah. So let's talk about today. Today was Monday, which means that my morning started with bump, <laughs> which I don't know why it sounds so funny to me, but it does. We are currently in week three of semester two. This week's theme, so the way it works is each week has a theme or a topic. Then we have pre-assigned essential reading that we have to do for it and some sort of sometimes questions or activities that we have to do. And then we show up to the lecture online on Zoom and we discuss, uh, usually there's some sort of presentation on the topic and then we discuss and sometimes we have breakout groups that do further activities or discussions. It hasn't been too bad, to be honest. I thought it'd be really hard to do online learning, but it's been okay, to be honest. Yeah, so this week, week three for BOMF, uh, the theme is underwear and accessories. <laughs> I know, if you know me, I am super into underwear, which never sounds, never stops sounding weird. But yeah, and this is also very prominent because I'm currently trying to make 18th century stains. <laughs> sounds just like... <laughs> It hard. Anyway, so I had a list of pre-assigned reading and uh, obviously so the prep for the week actually stops the week before because uh, my lectures are Monday, Tuesday, uh, Thursday and Friday. So that means that I have to do the prep for these before they happen. <laughs> but yeah, so I did all my prep for these for today and tomorrow online. Currently we're on lockdown so the library is closed. So we do a lot of online reading. But before that, in the first semester, I was actually able to get my reading list, go to the library, get some books and actually do physical book reading as well, which was really nice. But yeah, so we had this really interesting reading list about underwear. I read about stays, the utilitarian utilitarian aspect of stays and how they were worn by, you know, lower and working classes. It's not just, you know, tight lacing. <sighs> Ugh, don't even get me started. Anyway, I read about pocket hoops and their sort of uh, aspect as a barrier, so sort of almost like a, a control of who gets in your personal space, which was really interesting. Uh, and I read about, I read a bunch of different things, but so I just had the, there was a one hour pre-recorded lecture by a guest lecturer 
who was really nice. She, is, she specializes in a, a century indoor. And so we had the one hour pre-recorded lecture and then we had a one hour seminar where we sort of discussed the overall reading in a large group and then we went into breakout rooms to discuss particular prints. So I thought I'd show you that now. So this is my setup here. Uh, you may recognize it for being my sewing desk. <laughs> I just checked the copyright on this so that I'm actually allowed to show you this. But um, so this is the print that we had to discuss. I'll include it on the screen here so you can see it better. It is currently held at the British Museum and is a satirical print. So something that was really pointed forwards in the lecture is that obviously most people weren't painted in their underwear. So there's not a lot of resource, visual resources for uh, underwear. There are some excellent garments, um, but obviously one of the things that's been really pushed throughout is that we need to consider why extant garments survive. So often a lot of them on it are in a very little worn state. Um, often they are from the higher tiers of society because they can buy more, they can have more, and they also can switch between them so that they're less worn. Meanwhile, sort of working class clothes don't survive as much because they're really well worn through, mended, reused, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this, so one of the points that was uh, put through is that the long 18th century is really when sort of print culture sort of explodes um, and one of the good resources for it are satirical prints. You've probably seen them around, uh, some of them are funny, some of them make me question society's views towards women because what up with that? Anyway, this uh, plate isn't really called much, it's just called 1812 or Regency Yellow Mode um, and it has a really thorough description on the side which I recommend reading because it catches on some of the more nuances of the plate. But so yeah, so we were put into a breakout room with a group of my colleagues to discuss this print and we brought up some of the themes uh, that we thought were important regarding to what we was discussed in the uh, in, like initial discussion and the lecture. Uh, so I just thought I'd run through them because, I mean, this is the content, I guess. <laughs> so we talked about the materialistic nature of Regency period. So that's the one thing about the long 18th century. It's called the long 18th century because it goes into the 19th century. Uh, the Regency is often included in this sort of parcel packaged years, I guess. Yeah, so we talked about the consumption, which has been a massive th theme throughout most of my modules, is the rise of consumption. Because obviously production sort of exploded and then more people had more pecuniary power, power. So more people bought more things and that sort of really reflects on fashion. And we also talked about deception because this is like, the setting is meant to be lavish. And then at the top right corner, you can just see there is a bunch of bills that haven't been paid. So it's definitely a comment on buying for appearances or um, appearing to have more than you do. And that was a big, big theme because one of the anxieties that comes from the change in fashion is being un unable to tell class just by looking at people. That's one of the things that makes people really anxious in this time period. Um, and obviously, if you're able to buy and have unpaid bills, you can look above your class, I think, which is one of the things that make people anxious because that's like a, a really solid uh, society separation. Like it gave people comfort and confidence in their position. It's a lot deeper than I can get into right now, but it's a really interesting topic in case you wanted to research a bit more. And you know, there's lots of there's some sort of other iconography within the plate that sort of have other meanings. So we talked about the fact that there's like some sort of sickle weaving demon on top of the uh, clock. So this is also a reference to how long it takes to get dressed and how is a leisure activity. So obviously you're not a person who works, which again reinforces class and rank. Uh, there's the monkey, uh, there's Bacchus on top of the mirror, like frivolity, partying, you know. <laughs> that kind of discourse. Yeah, there's a lot to be unpacked in this plate, but it was a really interesting one. And there were three other groups who had three other different satirical prints uh, that addressed different aspects of how fashion is worn and port portrayed in this time period. I'm not sure what else I can tell you other than showing you through my notes, um, but that seems a little bit too nerdy for YouTube. I do have to do some prepping for the lecture tomorrow. So tomorrow I have applying this dress and textile history. I'll link the print down in the description box in case you want to look at it. Another thing I wanted to address really quickly is that when I mentioned on my Instagram a bit about the course, the first question I immediately get is, can you share more? Like, can you share the reading lists? And that's the one thing I can't do because, 
having worked in academic libraries and reading lists for four or five years, however long it was, uh, I've come. One of the biggest issues that we have is that often reading lists are considered intellectual property by the academics. I have many feelings of that, and this is not the place to disclose it. But yeah, so that that's why I can't really share reading lists or like course materials. But I will like I will maybe pick out my favorite readings or something and put it in the description box in case you're interested in doing some more exploration. The other thing that's really bad is that a lot of these resources are behind paywalls because that's also how academic publishing works and I also have many feelings about that which I can't share right now because we're focusing on what the topic of this video is. So yeah, I hope this video is not very long. I realize that I'm looking at the camera that I've already been talking for six minutes and I know my introduction has been very long and it's only Monday so please bear with me. Good morning you guys, welcome to Tuesday. So this morning we have applying dress and textile histories. It is a two hour slot, so I think it'll be like a lecture and then a seminar together. I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but we're quite a small group, so it's not like there's a lot of people. I think there's between 15 people around, depending on the module. And yeah, so I mentioned, I gave a brief, brief overview of applying yesterday. Uh, this week's theme is actually really interesting. Well, actually, they're all really interesting. And I just thought I'd show you this angle because this is usually what people on Zoom can see. <laughs> Unless um, sometimes I go to sort of a blank wall behind me if I want to look professional. <laughs> but usually this is what they see. Uh, this week was quite light on reading, actually. We only had to do two readings out of the list and some of them were quite short. And the theme this week is Can Academics Knit? Incorporating a craft practice into academic research. So this is really interesting because it's about a um, uh, sort of using archives and things you discover in archives to inform craft practices and then using crafters to develop your research by experimentation. So I guess it's a little bit like experimental history or experimental archaeology. And so the readings I did in particular was about the about Shetland lace knitting. The interesting thing about this is that uh, provided were some lace knitting patterns and we were actually asked if we know how to knit or if we have the materials around to try, see what happens. Sadly I didn't because I don't have any knitting materials around me. So this is a research collaboration between the University of Glasgow and I think Shetland Museums. But there were patterns labelled as Shetland in knitter's books from 1840s to the 1880s, uh, were selected for investigation, there were like over 450 volunteers of people to knit them and I think 140 people in the end sent over 300 samples and these samples they sort of made an ex exhibition to illustrate these um, patterns on these Victorian pattern books which is super cool. The other reading that I was actually thinking about, I think it's because the last, it's the last one that I read, was from a blog called Knitrospective, Nitro, Nitro which I think is really funny. And this was about handcrafting in the archives. So this one in particular was about someone investigating articles from the 1950s and letters from the 1950s which mentioned something called clique it or clique work which wasn't which was at risk of becoming lost as the generations of men who traditionally took on this work were passing. And then it was it's this whole investigation about trying to replicate this stitch from like written descriptions in letters only and then doing some more investigation into it. Yeah, basically just trying to discover anything about this clique thing and they went through the archives and found more information about it. Uh, something about a clique original hook as well. And then they held workshops to teach this stitch to more people so that it wouldn't sort of disappear. And also like using this stitch to re-catalogue things already in archive. Anyway, it's just really interesting example of how like archival research can lead you to rediscover crafts that are going out of modern knowledge because they usually like traditionally passed down and those communities are you know diverging paths or it's just people sometimes just don't are not interested in those old crafts anymore uh, but some of us are so um yeah it's just a really interesting example of that and i think the theme for this week technically because applying is about applying sort of research in practical ways. And this is a really good example of the kind of um, sort of impacting effect of research. Anyway, I'm really excited for this session. I really want to see what everyone else knit. Um, this it. And that is the plan for the morning. Uh, so I don't think I'll like video myself doing 
the live share just because you can barely see my screen and like it's literally just me staring at a screen <laughs> so I don't think that'll be very exciting so yeah I think I'll just check in after the lecture and let you know how I went and what else I learned hours I had my lecture it was really good so we had two guest lecturers they were both academics in the University of Glasgow and they were talking about their project which I mentioned briefly in the introduction which was about Shetland lace knitting which I'd never heard about before but basically it was really useful because they used what I think is still a bit considered a bit of a new methodology for research which is they did a bit of crowdsourcing and they did sort of uh, making experimental practice so which is, you know, what we're all about here on the YouTubes. So their project was they found uh, these Shetland knitting lace pattern books. These knitters volunteered to knit some samples following the patterns. And then that sort of informs on actual making practices, uh, sort of the audience skill level that the patterns were intended, intended to or for. Yeah, it's just really interesting. This is the kind of research that I'm really interested in. And yeah, overall, it was really good. And they were talking about how the sort of project hinged on authenticity, creativity and sustainability, which are all excellent uh, mottos. And also about some outputs from the project, which was they found that the University of Glasgow had a farm with sheep. <laughs> so they got the fleece, got it spun and made University of Glasgow yarn, which I thought was so cool. <laughs> yeah, and we just talked a bit about the benefits and the disadvantages of this type of research. But that is it for applying dress and textile histories for this week. I do have some work to get done this afternoon, which is I have my work placement uh, sort of slotted hours on Thursday morning. So I need to do some prep for that. It is just doing some online research and some typing up. So I might include some of that. We'll see. <laughs> but yeah, I'll go have some lunch and then get back to work.
Hello you guys! So I actually wasn't planning on filming today uh, because today is Wednesday and Wednesday is usually my non-university day. It's the day I used to like do video editing, uh, actual part-time work and other kinds of things. Uh, but I managed to finish my work a little bit early. My video editing took less time than I thought, which like never happens. Uh, so I just thought I'd talk you through what I do to prepare for the next week. So I usually have to start preparing all the reading because there are usually quite a lot of it the week before. So I'm just taking a, a look now at my first module, which is Bonf, Birth of Modern Fashion, which happens on Monday. The, what I usually do is that I have a folder, which is for the module, and then I have folders within it for weeks. And so we're going into week four, which is titled Part 1, Cut and Construction of Women's Wear, which <laughs> I am thrilled about, very exciting. And usually the way it works is we'll have on the Moodle or on the handbook or on the online reading list, they'll, they'll let us know what the essential reading is. And because currently we're on lockdown and we're not allowed in the library, a lot of this reading is available online. So they're usually articles or ebooks or sometimes blog posts. We've had podcasts. It's been really cool, really good variety of sort of readings to do. Uh, so the first <laughs> the first reading that is on here uh, for us to do is actually Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion One, which I own. <laughs> so cool. So I'll just be grabbing that and looking at it later. But so what I usually do is I do a scan of, before I actually start reading anything, I do a scan of all the things I have to do just to sort of, in my mind, know how long I'm gonna need to do that. And then I also download all of the reading that I can to make sure I have it all in one place. And this helps me because further on, when I have essays and assignments to do, I can think back and think, oh, there was this one reading in week four that I think might be relevant. And then I don't have to go and do the whole search for it again. I already have it stored in my computer and within reach. And this usually does help cut down on sort of my preparation time for essays and assignments. So I'm just gonna download everything that's available. So yeah, I'm just gonna like zoom through this bit now. Okay, so next week is actually quite light on reading um, and it's about the construction of 18th century clothing, which I have made before. So I'm really excited about that because it's with a guest lecturer. She's the curator at the National Museum of Scotland. Uh, no, sorry, Glasgow Museum, which I think is in association with National Museum of Scotland. I'm not sure. But yeah, so that's a really cool, she's been a guest lecturer on the course before and that's, she's really cool. So I'm really excited about that. And obviously, so that's, I think this is a good point, good moment to put Forwards, two points that I wanted to mention. The second point I wanted to make is, I'm not sure, I don't think I mentioned this in the introduction, which is a bit dumb, but this is definitely not a making degree. This is an academic research, uh, sort of historian kind of route. It's not to do with construction. You don't have to make anything. We only really discuss construction in the sense of it informs us on sort of uh, trade markets, labor markets, textile markets, that kind of thing. There's no making really. Um, there are there's some interesting research going into experimental archeology, span experimental history, embodied dress, which I hope to explore more in the future. More on that later. But the degree itself doesn't ask you to make anything and you don't need to like design, create, so make anything. So if that's what you're looking for, you're probably looking more for a costume design or costume construction degree, not an MA in history of art, dress and textiles histories. <laughs> Since this was really productive, what I think I'm going to do actually is I'm going to look forwards to applying, which is next week on Tuesday, and I'm going to see what reading I have to do for that. And the other thing I'll also mention is that um, in terms of assignments, all of these modules are pretty much structured the same, where you've got sort of a mid-semester presentation, uh, which can be individual or in groups, and then you've got an end-of-semester essay written assessment. Uh, our sort of mid-semester presentation is actually coming up soon. It'll be in two or three weeks. And for applying, uh, we're made into groups. So uh, I'm gonna quickly look up what I might have to do for that. And I also have to look into, so for a birth of modern fashion, the mid-semester mid presentation is actually about your essay topic for the end of semester assignment, which I don't have yet. <laughs> I find it really hard to commit to a topic because Libra or you know just other general commitment issues and I kind of want to study everything but I really need to sort of dig down go through all the reading list for all the weeks and pick a topic that I'd like to write about and that I think could be written about 
So I think I'm going to tackle that today because I've managed to find these little few hours where I have some extra time. So yeah, I'll see you guys either later on or tomorrow. Good morning, you guys. Yes, believe it or not, it is the morning, whether this light deceives you or not. We actually have a really busy this morning. And um, so on Thursdays, which is today, there is a thing from nine to 10, which is called the coffee hour, which is for everyone in our uh, MA course to just get together and uh, chat because we don't really have an opportunity to meet outside of class. Uh, so it's just a nice opportunity to chat and the module convenience is there, so if you have any questions about the course, we can also ask. I usually miss it because I have, it used to be at 10 and I had a class at 10, uh, but now it's at nine and I'm usually just not functional at nine. So I'm just gonna jump in on that and then I'll tell you a bit more about the rest of the morning soon. Just finished my workplace meeting. It was two hours, which was what was scheduled for anyway. And I've got a snack <laughs> because I always get really hungry during these morning meetings, um, but I can't eat on camera. So my friend Emily sent me some homemade macaroons, which I've squished, very sorry, but um, I'm mean, very, very excited to eat. Um, so I thought, I'll talk to you guys about stuff. I snack which actually was a very bad idea but I just discovered that this has both normal buttercream and coffee buttercream inside and I am living. I guess you just eat and then talk. She knows that I'm obsessed with buttercream so the amount of buttercream in these is phenomenal. Okay so bird placement. I think I mentioned in my intro that I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to disclose about this so I'm just going to give a quick overview. So my work placement is in collaboration with the, well, it's not in collaboration, is with the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. It's amazing, um, really exciting. Uh, there is no on-site work, uh, it's all remote, and it's for a digital project where we're sort of tracking and discovering more information about pioneering dress historians and curators. So we each get assigned uh, some curators who have unfortunately passed away and we're doing some research into their lives, their curatorship, their body of work, and then hopefully writing some outputs uh, to have a sort of a register of our discoveries. And then the other one is that we've been given people who have worked closely with the VNA in the past and we will be interviewing them. So that's all very exciting. I won't be disclosing any names or anything because I'm not sure I'm allowed to. <laughs> uh, but usually our meetings are about sort of the sort of uh, administrative side of doing this sort of oral history research project and sort of all the implications of that and also sort of developing other skills that are important in the field um, and today we had a guest speaker um, she is a she's a curator and she also worked at the VNA and she worked really closely with the Heather Furbank collection which is freaking amazing if you don't know about the Heather Furbank, Furbank collection I'll add some images here um, it's really cool, it was one of the first acquisitions in the Victoria and Albert and it's sort of, I think she said over 200 items of uh, her wardrobe. So yeah, there's a really cool book about it, I'll, I'll put it in the description box if you're interested in more of that. Uh, but we're talking about it because the person that I'm writing about is Madeleine Ginsberg, who was a um, curator within the department and so she was pretty instrumental in those foundational years 
of the textile department at the VNA. And I've discovered some really good things about her just by searching online. She's a really interesting po person and she did so many things. But anyway, it's just to show you as well that this field, dress history, it's not just about <laughs> looking at dresses. Um, you can also sort of take the sort of muse museum curatorship approach. You can discover more about the actual people who work in the field, which can inform you about how you can work in the field. It's really interesting, broad and varied. And I, I'm really grateful that I get this opportunity to do this work placement because it is giving me a different look that wouldn't have been provided otherwise I think because it's not something that you usually sort of approach but yeah really good so that was my morning session I'm now having a quick snack break <laughs> this afternoon I'm actually not scheduled to do any university work but there is I have to draft a contact letter to my interviewee and I would like to start doing some reading for next week uh, but at the same time uh, my eyes are quite tired from the zoom all morning so what I usually do is around lunchtime I'll have a break where I do some hand sewing or something and then I'll return to it in the afternoon. So I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to finish my snack then have lunch and then possibly do some more. Oh, and the other thing I want to mention. This morning was really busy because my, two, Thursday morning is actually my preventive conservation slot, which I've talked to you about in the intro. It's my third module, which I'm auditing. But that happened to clash with this meeting. This meeting is usually on Friday afternoons, but it was moved to this morning. And this was entirely my fault. I would never had a timetable clash before. My brain didn't really compute. So because I'm only auditing the other class, it's not for assignments, I decided to miss that one. But I have asked my colleagues for notes and I'll be catching up in my own time. And I think I haven't mentioned either in this video, but I thought I'd talk to you really briefly about what contact hours are in here. So. It's not very different from my undergraduate degree, which I did in English Lit. We had four modules per semester and eight contact hours, so two per module. So at the moment we have three modules, two contact hours, and then I would say from rough estimation, but depending on the reading lists, there's usually about sort of six hours independent work to do before that. So six hours of reading, you know, thinking, researching, that kind of thing. Um, I would say about six hours, depending on how fast you read. I think I'm slower when I have to read it on the computer. So that sort of gives you an idea of the workload and sort of how to structure your week, I guess. I know there are some people in the degree who are doing it part time. And if you do it part time, you only do, I think it's one or two modules per semester and it's two years instead of one. And now that I'm doing it, I kind of wish I'd done that because it just makes it longer. I think the one year is going by really fast and I don't want it to end. <laughs> so yeah, just some food for thought, I guess. And yeah, I'm gonna eat my second macaroon. Hello everyone. So today is Saturday. And you may be thinking, but cat, Saturday's the weekend. What do you mean? The week of a dress history student belongs into the weekend. Sadly, this is true. <laughs> so the way it works is that most of my work is condensed into the weekend because both of my lectures, well, the main lectures are on Monday and Tuesday. So I could start doing the prep earlier, but I do find that having the readings fresh in my mind help me helps me like keep <laughs> the, the discussion fresh. Uh, <laughs> Oh god, not funny on the weekends. But yeah, so that's what we're going to be doing today. I'm going to be reading, doing the reading for my module, which is Breath of Modern Fashion, month, uh, which is a Monday. And uh, I know that I I know that during the week I already checked what I had to do, and it wasn't too much. So I'm really excited about that because that means I'll have some time to sew in the evening. Uh, and yesterday, so I didn't feel anything yesterday because I didn't do anything degree related yesterday. Uh, yesterday was reserved to do some work other kinds of work <laughs> and some filming and sewing which I do somehow still need to make time for <laughs> so I'm just gonna check uh, what I have my computer here I think it's just a little bit off screen I'm still trying to find a good angle for my desk uh, let me know what you guys think I know the only thing I can remember is that I have to read some from this which is great because I do have it uh, in case you guys are wondering this is Patterns of Fashion by Janet Arnold uh, you if you're into dress history or sewing, historical sewing of any sort, you've probably heard of these books before. Uh, Janet Arnold was a dress historian 
who went to many museum collections and took patterns from excellent garments. Uh, and then she put them all into these books, um, which have like really wonderful illustrations of the dresses. Can you see me? And then on the other side, they've got the patterns. There we go. Uh, and they also have some nice introductions with some sort of overviews about patterns and clothes of the time. So that's really useful. If you're trying to get your hand, hands on these books, they're quite hard to get now uh, because the these are published in conjunction with um, school. Well, these aren't actually. I think from what I understand, the School of Hist Historical Dress has acquired the uh, publishing rights for Patterns of Fashion 1 to 4. And they're going to re release a new edition for the first four books. Uh, they've also been releasing book five, and I think they have more in the works based on Janet Arnold's patterns that didn't get published and some of their own. So it's a really, really interesting initiative and project if you want to check it out. Uh, but yeah, so these books are quite hard to get by now. Uh, I only have the first one because at the time I could only afford one and I was trying to make a hobble on less, so this is the one I bought. But they are really useful books just to get a sense of the patterns. I've never actually used them to like scale up a pattern, but they were really useful for me when I was trying to drape or draft and I could compare like the pattern shapes to see what they looked like. Yeah, so I need to read pages 3 to 9 and 22 to 49, which sound like introductions to me. So that's what I'm going to do now. So I've just sort of flicked through because this isn't actually the book introduction, I guess. Uh, it's like a little uh, paragraph written by uh, Janet Arnold, I believe. And then it has just a selection of extracts uh, from different sort of letters, magazines, books uh, from 1660s to 1860s as possible. I made some quick notes of the information that I thought was uh, new or worth reinforcing or that I might need to reference later on and use this as a reference. But there is an emphasis on the fact that uh, the distribution of fashions uh, was by letter, newspaper accounts, and by little dolls. I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but they used to make like miniature versions of dresses on little dolls, and these dolls got posted around between people. And so, like a lady would buy one, and she would then take it to like a dressmaker or a milliner, and then you know to make a dress like that. It's pretty cool. I'll insert a photo of one if I can find one. Uh, but we saw one from the V&A in a lecture recently and they're really cool. And then from the 1770s, print sort of explodes. And so you get like magazines and fashion plates and from 1790 colored uh, by hand fashion plates. But also that sort of home dressmaking gained more popularity around the 1840s. So it wasn't that common, I guess, for people to make their clothes at home until then. And also that the sewing machine became really popular from the 1860s. So it was quite rare to find a dress made after the 1860s without any sort of machine sewing on it. And we did some more research into the sewing machine last semester and we found that this is true. <laughs> so like it was commonly used mostly for skirt seams because they were the longest seams and that's where we could save the most time. But usually hand finishing and sometimes bodices were still made by hand. It really depended on who was doing what, I guess. And then there's a really interesting sort of dictionary of terms used by tailors from the 1688, which just is really thorough and really cool. So like it says open before, that is to be laced on the breast, open behind, laced on the back, which fashion hath always a maid or woman to dress the wearer. Important note. Uh, and then there's like ex uh, excerpts from letters and books, really interesting all around. Um, and then there's a section that talks about Louis XIV, which, who in 1675 decided that women could also make women's dress. So up until then, there were sort of two two sort of people that made dresses or clothes. There was a tailor who made almost everything and there was someone called a seamster, which was also a man, I believe, that owned the business anyway. And they made linens, like smaller items. It says here like smocks, linens, ruffs, cravats. Uh, so they didn't make like the body of the dress, but they made sort of all the stuff around it. And then from 1675, uh, they make the dressmaker or a sometimes called mantua maker. Uh, so they could make Mm -mm. Wrapping gowns, skirts, jackets, hungerlines, dressing jackets, bodices, and other work for women, girls, and children, but not trained over skirts for gowns or corsets. So stays were still the stay maker domain. 
which I thought was really interesting. And then there's like thorough instructions from a book for dressmakers about how to make dresses, I guess. And there's also this really cool sort of sketch easy of this is a pattern for a Francaise, which looks super simple, but <laughs> is it really? <laughs> I really want to make a Francaise, but we'll see. Uh, so that was the first section I had to read. And so the thing is, there's like really thorough descriptions about how to actually construct these gowns on here. But unfortunately, I'm a visual learner. <laughs> so if you give me like a bunch of like really thorough descriptions in English, my brain just sort of shuts down. Um, don't know if it's because it's a second language or what it is, but my brain shuts down and I can't deal. But the other section is 22 to 49, which I think is just looking at patterns. Yeah, it is. Well, I've already seen all of these, so <laughs> I'm not going to spend too much time. But this is a lovely book just to get a sense of the fashions. And there is something on here that I did want to show you because I just came across it and I want to make it. But I saw this image on Pinterest, like, oh wait, this isn't a sewing video. Never mind. <laughs> this is a focus. This is a dress history. There's just a good shoot. Anyway, so the book is really useful because it does have small things like a pocket, stomachers. It's really great all together, you know. Um, you can see this is the one I was talking about. Um, but yeah, and I think the point of us looking at construction of dresses, I mean, <laughs> the lecture on Monday will clear it up. But as a curator, it's quite important to know what you've got. And if you don't have knowledge about textiles, working knowledge of textiles, construction, dresses and stuff, then you might, it would be hard to identify what's in your collection, especially since a lot of sort of 18th century stuff then got made up into new things in the 19th century. Like it was quite, quite common to recycle that fabric because that fabric is expensive. Like we read the other day that um, it took one silk, well, enough silk to for one dress in one bolt, one 18th century dress, it took a weaver four months to do that. Four months! Imagine the expense! Like, obviously these fabrics were reused later on. I'll find that reference if anyone's interested. It was from an article by John Stiles, uh, who is a really, really great dress historian. Um, he writes some really cool stuff. Very accessible books if you're looking for something to read into dress history. I recommend um, his writing. And, oh yeah, the other thing that they mentioned on here is that there's a whole section about the widths of fabric. So I don't know if you know this, but fabric was much, much narrower back then. Between, I think they say between 19, 19 inches wide to 20 yards. So imagine making like a Francaise out of silk that's 20 in inches wide. Christ alive. <laughs> anyway, yeah, um, so that's really cool. Something that I've also started doing is that when I, um, so I think I've already mentioned that I write down notes for everything that I read so that when I need to sort of find find readings to support my arguments and essays and stuff I can just browse through my notes really quickly to see what I need but the thing I've also started doing is I put the publication date next to the title because that informs me a lot about the content as well because uh, early dress historians from the 20th century are sometimes questionable not to mention sexist had a whole Instagram rant about this. Maybe I'll make a video. Let me know. And yes, it is. Cunnington, I'm coming for you. So this section that I just had to read is a very quick sort of overlook of the 18th century. And it's, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, a bit annoying that throughout she refers to states as corsets, but it seems to be interchangeable in academia sometimes, which confuses me because I thought it was pretty set out. Anyway, uh, the section opens with saying that the mantuas don't really survive. There are very few surviving mantuas because they were remade into new dresses. I'd literally just said that, so I thought it was really cool. Or I thought it, I can't remember if I said it on video or not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so mantuas became the court dress and then the sack back gown became the informal wear. Uh, and they were pretty loose shaped garments until about the 1740s where they started being shaped to the body. Uh, hoops were com co common in Britain from 1711, but they were different from the Fardingale and they were different from French hoops. Apparently, uh, what did they say? English hoops like went straight down and French hoops sloped down. Interesting, didn't know that. 
and the hoops were sort of a sign of wealth and power because you needed more fabric and you displayed more fabric, hence wealth, on yourself. <laughs> Hope that made sense. Um, dresses were pinned into place, that's something we knew, but I find it quite interesting and quite hard to do on myself every time I try to pin a dress on. It hasn't worked out very well for me, so I need to get better at that. Um, and then they mentioned short jackets and petticoats or something called a short gown for the middle for the lower and middle classes for working women um and then around the 1780s uh the sort of fancy dresses get more shaped and closer to the body and the anglaises show up that's my fave and then the hoop was finally abandoned in court uh in english courts in, in 1818 when queen charlotte died and the changes in the 1790s were towards the neoclassical style the waist rows you get regency all of that jazz so yeah, that was a pretty useful sort of little overview and I have a bit more reading to do but I think I'm going to leave it for a little later on because I still have some light and I want to do some sewing while I have some light and I'll read a bit later on. Um, the other thing I have to do today is, so I mentioned that we have to do presentations and we have to do, so one of my presentations for BOMF, the presentation from BOMF is actually to introduce my final assignment topic. And I did some preliminary research the other day to try and find out what I wanted to do. Uh, so I think, so we have to present these ideas to the class and the module convener. And if it doesn't get shut down, I would like to talk about or write about, I suppose. Um, the, so a big theme in the 18th century are tensions between uh, the private and the public. And I thought I'd like to take that and look at some sartorial transgressions. And in particular, I'd like to look at Marie Antoinette and the Hobongol, or as we call it, the chemise à la reine. There's been a fair bit written about it, so I'm not sure if I'll be a, like if it'll be. So they don't really say you can't write about this, but they'll tell you, you know, your your research is meant to find a gap or a new approach or a new perspective if something has already been written about it. So yeah, I'd like to investigate a bit more about the construction of privacy in the 18th century, sartorial transgressions, and may and use the sort of chemise à la reine as an example, but probably not the focus of the essay because so much has been written about it. Uh, I want to do a little bit more reading on that as well before I have to present my idea because I don't want it to sound dumb in front of the whole class. <laughs> Uh, so that's what I'll be doing tonight as well. And tomorrow I'll need to do the prep for the other module, which is applying dress and textile histories. So I think the next little vlog session will be tomorrow. So see you guys tomorrow. Hello, you guys. Welcome to Sunday. Uh, there are a couple of points I just wanted to make really quick before we talk about what I do on Sundays, I guess. Um, Something that's been bothering me since I talked about it first on, I think it was Monday, uh, the fashion plate that we discussed in Birth of Modern Fashion. It, I forgot to tell you something about it and it keeps bothering me in the back of my head. And then it's like, next time you vlog, remember, talk about this. And I always forget. That was actually George IV, the Prince of Wales, in that fashion plate. Which brings me to something I think I didn't mention, but that is really important, important and was stressed quite a lot in the lecture, is that I know people love using sort of political satires, um, satires, 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 that's satires, satires, for like historical fashion commentary. But something that was really stressed in the lecture and that's really important to keep in mind is that the, those prints are first of and foremost a political commentary, always. <laughs> fashion is usually used as a device to do that political commentary and so it really relies on exaggeration. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Uh, the fashion commentary that is in there is usually just used to supplement the political commentary. Um, <laughs> so it's quite important. So like his whole, like in that particular fashion plate, um, the sort of the whole like fashion element on there, the sort of the time it takes to get dressed, all that, all those references are only meant to support the fact that George IV wasn't very well liked by the public because he was seen as frivolous and um, sort of, and excessive. So 
always keep that in mind when you're looking at those kinds of prints. There's always a political commentary and that's usually more important than the fashion commentary that they're using. The other thing I want to mention is that I'm not sure how long this video is going to be, but just realizing how much I've rambled through them, I think it's going to be pretty long, which is why I haven't recorded everything that I do. So there's a lot of other reading that I've been doing in the background that I haven't uh, put on here. There's a lot of other work that I've been doing, uh, but I didn't, I don't think you guys would want to sit through that. Uh, so I haven't included it here. I'm really not sure how much of this you want to sit through at all, but yeah, that's just something I want to mention. And so today we are now going to tackle the prep for the second module of the week, which is applying dress and textile histories. And actually this is a really interesting week because I think um, across both the week that's just passed and the prep that I'm doing for next week, the topics are all by kind of costume related, which is <laughs> really interesting that I randomly picked this week to vlog. Um, but yeah, so for applying dress and textile histories, title of this week is The Devil's Brood, Dressing Henry II in His Fighting Family. And this session is going to be with a guest lecturer again, and this is going to be with someone from Past Pleasures, the oldest costume and interpretation company in the country, I imagine. And they're responsible for historical costuming at sites such as Dover Castle, Kensington Palace, the Tower of London and Hampton Court. So it's really interesting because last semester we didn't really talk that much about costume like how dress history can feed into costume but this is definitely sort of one of the applications of dress history is that it can inform historical research for costuming companies who do sort of live reenactments and that kind of thing um, education settings in historic houses and things like that so a couple of the things i need to do is sort of think about education and outreach um sort of i need to do some notes on that and what i think and uh, look at some websites and then also do you probably you guys have probably already seen this but ages ago there was this thing going around which was um, a history of royal fashion uh, which was held at future learn and this was in collaboration with or was made by the university of glasgow and it's direct correlation to this course so one of the sections and that is actually recommended for us to look at this week which is the ditchly dress real life versus recreation and i did go through the whole of the course before i even thought about applying to this degree um but that was a few years ago so i'm gonna go through it again just to remember and i'll put a link in the description box i think the course is uh, sort of free from time to time on future learn so you guys can join in and it's it's really good and um, it's really interesting so and it's a good taster session for dress history. That's what I'm going to do. I will, I think I'm going to wrap it up here just because of how long this video is already. Yep, so I just wanted to say a big thank you to my top tier patrons, uh, Rhonda, Barbara, Lourdes and Alexa. Thank you so much for your support on there. It keeps me going as you know. Um, if you'd like to check out my Patreon, I'll leave the link uh, down below in at the box here. And yeah, let me know if you like to know more about the course um, or well, the things I'm learning and researching because I love to talk about this stuff and I don't really have the opportunity to talk to a lot of people about it. <laughs> so I'm happy to talk at the camera and share it with you guys. Um, I've been learning lots of really interesting things and doing my own research in my spare time. And I'd like to share that with you guys if you're interested. So yeah, let me know if you'd like more adventures in the life of a dress history student. 